welcome everyone and uh, welcome to African for Good. Uh, today we have a wonderful little chat uh, lined up for you. Uh, the show today, of course, brought to you by explore.org. My name is Russell Gerber and uh, thank you for joining us with uh, chatting today about one of Africa's most recognizable birds, uh, flamingos. And today I'm joined by the wonderful Esther van der Westhuizen Kutzer. She is environmental specialist at Ekapa Mines. Um, and it's a great pleasure to have her on the show today. So thanks for joining us, Esther, and welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Russell. Pleasure to be here. Okay, Esther. So thanks for joining us. And uh, tell us a little bit about what you do. Well, I'm the environmental specialist for Ekapa Mining. Um, and my job entails to keep the mine environmental friendly as far as possible. And we're not to interfere and to, to get them on the right path. Um, but one of these things is you always have to do other projects, um, especially the fluffy projects that we call them. And one of them is Canvas Dam's Flamingos, which is very close and dear to the owner's hearts. So um, that's one of my main focus areas is Canvas Dam and keeping Canvas Dam clean and, and nice and, and the flamingos alive or as close as possible to alive so that everybody can enjoy them. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the, I can see the beautiful picture behind you of those lovely uh, flamingos. You know, I think a lot of people out there, you know, won't know too much about Camphers Dam. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? We've got some live cameras that are going to be going up at, uh, at Camphers Dam in the not too distant future, um, which is really exciting. Can you give us a bit of background about the area? Yes, Camphers Dam is situated in the northern Cape of South Africa. Um, and it is a seasonal pan, or it used to be a seasonal pan until about 20 years ago, um, which means that it only got water during the rainy season, which is um, for September to March in South Africa. Um, and then the flamingos used to come there. This is also a salt pan, so the salt levels is very high in this pan. Um, and it's also the, drain, the main drainage point for most of Kimberley. So all the water would run down to Campus Dam. And the flamingos used to roost there. Um, and this used to be a tourist attraction for the Northern Cape. Everybody that drove through Kimberley would then have the beautiful view of Campus Dam with the lovely flamingos. This is also, uh, Campus Dam also belongs to some parts of it to the local municipality and then most parts to a private owner um, that has a game farm on the other side of, of Campus Dam. And um, yeah, Campus Dam at this stage gets some water from the Homevale sewage, um, sewage plant um, that has to manage the, obviously how clean the water is. And then obviously we know with the infrastructure in South Africa, we have great difficulty to maintain the water quality um, at, at has, it has to be. So there's huge infrastructure problems and so on and so on. Yeah, I imagine that must be very difficult to deal with, considering all of the various people and, and communities, everybody utilizing the water before it's even getting into Campus Dam. Um, how long have people been, been well, how long have we been seeing the flamingos at Campus Dam? How long can uh, you remember? Well, as if I speak to all the old people in Kimberley that has been living here their whole <laughs> life, they would say that since forever they can remember. So I could track it back to the 1950s yeah. that the flamingos was here seasonally whenever there was water in the pan, but never breeding until 2007. So the flamingos has forever been a part of, of Kimberley, yes. Okay, so that brings us to our next point. So why is Campus Dam so important for flamingos? <clears throat> Um, there's only before Campus Dam or was before the birds started breeding at Campus Dam, there was only three other breeding sites in Africa for lesser flamingos. Um, and the whole, the whole project started um, about in, in 2006 around the Bryflace fires where the people had a discussion, including my two bosses with, um, with environmental affairs at that stage, Mark Anderson. And they said, wouldn't it be lovely if we can keep the flamingos here permanently? And so the island was born um, and both the Honey brothers put in some effort and they got it designed by specialists. They flew to France to see what those Flamingo Islands looked like and the whole thing was designed accordingly. Um, so in 2006, um, they all got together, got the necessary permits and then the Flamingo Island um, was born. And then in 2007, when everybody um, thought that this might, might have been a, a bogus investment, 
the flamingos all of a sudden started flying and they built their first nests. So that made um, Campus Dam then the fourth breeding site in Africa for lesser flamingos, which was great because between 2007 and 2010, about 26,000 young flamingos was uh, born and bred on that island. 26,000? Yep, 26,000. Wow, that's, uh, that's amazing. So since 2006, seven, basically, this has all been going on, actually nesting at the site, which is unbelievable. And that was because uh, Ekapa built that island. Is that right? That's because Ekapa built the island, but then in 2010, there was a huge flood in the area and the, the island got flooded. And then the birds did yeah. not breathe there and the island was not restored. There was a back and forth okay. if they should restore this or not. And then in 2016, all of a sudden, the flamingos started breeding on their own without the island on the southwestern side of, of the dam, which was incredible. And for that season yeah. alone, they raised about 5,000 chicks. Um, and it was the first time that they've done that without the island. So, yeah, the island is quite a great idea. It just got the flamingos to swing their head to see that Campus Dam is actually a great place to breed. And then after that, they they made it on their own. That's such a cool story. It, you know, you're not, not a lot of times you see these projects turning around no. an entire area like that and changing animal behavior, which is really, really special. You know, you yes. mentioned the lesser flamingos. Do we get the greater flamingos there as well? Yes, you get a portion of the greater flamingos there as well. Um, the flamingo numbers um, vary between, it depends on what time of the year, winter time, sometimes the flamingos fly to other areas and there's only a few or a little of them left. Um, so the numbers of lesser flamingos is between 10,000 and up to 71,000 in a good year. And then the lesser wow. of the greater flamingos is about 3,000. The last count we did was about 3,000 greater flamingos in the area. Okay. All right. So they don't, they don't live here all year round as well, as you say. So they move well, around as well? Every time I go to, to campus dam, there's always a flamingo or two. Um, as, as I say, the, sometimes you get five to 10,000 of them. Sometimes you get up to 71,000. So it depends on the season and it depends on the algae growth in the dam, obviously, which we also closely monitor hand in hand with BirdLife South Africa. We draw maps on a monthly basis to see what the algae growth looks like. And then we go out for a count and we see, okay, there's now 10,000, and that correlates with the amount of algae that's that's present in the in the water at that stage. But high summer months between November and February, you have up to 71,000 birds um, at any stage at Campus Dam. Oh, that's unbelievable. You know, the first time I saw the the flamingos at Campus Dam, I was doing a a safari experience, a wonderful experience, which I'm sure you know about that uh, luxury train that goes through Kimberley. Um, you know, this was the Rovos Rail, a wonderful, wonderful experience. And we stopped at the dam just outside Kimberley on the way out um, after, of course, going to the diamond mines and checking out all that wonderful history. But yeah, it's a, it's an amazing sight. And I, and then the first time I did it was before 2016 and I remember the numbers were a lot lower than than what you've seen in the, in recent years which is incredible I can't wait to get back there yeah I can't yeah, wait to get back of, there you're talking about your experience with flamingos I can remember when this big island was built in 2006 I was busy with my master's degree and I can remember we all went like we would like a project like that in future and then um, a few years later, I got the opportunity to work with the with the big flamingo bosses, which is which is a very very yeah. nice job to have. Yeah, that's incredible. You know, since then, as you say, we've seen some really good numbers on the flamingos and and great things that have happened with them. But are there any threats uh, for the flamingos on the ground at Round Compass? <laughs> I mean, we spoke a little bit about water quality. Um, any other kinds of things that that the flamingos need to worry about? Yes, there's uh, obviously the, the, the fact that the Northern Cape is a, is a semi-desert area or semi-arid area. Um, the rain can stay away for long periods of time. And I'm sure all of you can remember the 2019 issue where there was so little water that 2,000 chicks had to be rescued. Um, that is the biggest problem is we can't get the water balance right, either by rain or by the, the sewage overflow that needs to go to, to the campus dam. That's most probably the biggest threat. Either there's too much water and the flamingos can't breed, or there's too little water and we have to interact and see what we can do to, to keep the flamingo babies alive.
life, obviously. So that's one of the biggest issues. And then the second issue that we do have is, is water quality. Um, sometimes we are monitoring that very closely to see what the water quality looks like, um, especially if you see birds starting to die, then there has to be an oil investigation. The third big thing that we do have with the flamingos or problems we have is the local communities and their dogs. They usually go <clears throat> hunting in the area. And obviously, there's nothing bigger fun for a dog to do than chase flamingos. So that's a big issue, especially during breeding season, because then the flamingos can abandon the nests and leave the, the young behind. And those are most probably then eaten by the dogs. Um, and sometimes the community members also hunt flamingos to eat. So that's quite a great or a big problem, or the three biggest problems that we do experience with the flamingos. Okay, are there any natural predators in the area for the flamingos? Well, you have a few, you have a few jackals and a few caracals um, in the area. And with the releases that we did in 2019, um, obviously the more tame birds were were high high prey for them. Um, and so yes, we did get some caracal that that caught some some flamingos. And then obviously yes, we also have some um, some other predators in the area like jackal. Um, that can, mm -hmm. can hunt some of them. And obviously fish eagle. Fish eagles, these very lazy fish eagles in our area, they, um, they, you can see them sometimes hunting at least one flamingo young, youngster a, a day for, for food. Yeah, I imagine actually. I didn't even think about the eagles, but yeah, they would, they would definitely go for a, for a helpless flamingo chick. A lack um, of duty okay, so a lot yeah, exactly. So a lot of a lot of things that they have to worry about, and then of course, you know, for, from your point of view, actually conserving and protecting the whole area. Um, for you yourself, I mean, you said that there was a project that this was a kind of project that you always wanted to be involved in. But but why flamingos? What's special about them, and what do you love about them? Well, what I like about flamingos, well, they are birds. Um, my master's degree was on birds. It was more specific on white back night herons in the middle of all. So I like to, to work on a species, specific species, um, and flamingos, if you have never met the flamingo, you wouldn't know what I'm talking about, but they are very cute. Um, since the day they open the egg until the day you release them or until the day that you, you, you let them go, they are very cute um, birds and they are magnificent flamboyant animals um, just to see in the wild as well and to watch their behavior. And you wouldn't think that a bird like that would have great behavior or great um, sense of development uh, or a very large biological importance, but they do. They are great indicator species um, of water quality and what's in the water. So they are just magnificent birds, and that's why I like them, except for the fact that they are birds, and I do like birds. <laughs> Me too. I'm a big fan of birds. I'm more a fan of the big mammals, as you can see, but I, I do love the birds. And flamingos, certainly, as you say, it's something really incredible to see, especially when they're in numbers like that all together at campers. Um, and, you know, I mentioned the first time I saw them on the train. Um, for you, is there any special memory or sighting at, in particular at campers there? Well, there's actually a few. I think one of the things that I will remember for a very, very long time is the rescue in 2019 and how many hours we worked. Um, not only feeding them, um, flying them out to various rehabilitation centers, but also all the permits that had to go with that and all the legal stuff that we had to get in line. And then obviously when they came back, the release, um, some of them or great numbers of them we had to release during the winter time. And then uh, a group of us, about five of us had to go back daily to make sure that um, they get additional food because the, the food was, the food algae was very low during that time. So then you kind of form a special bond with them because you go out at five o'clock, you take your cameras, you sit in the cold weather, Kimberly can go to minus 11, um, and you take some pictures. And sometimes the birds wander out of the water, obviously the tame ones, after feeding, and they come and just sit around you and roost. Um, sometimes they come to, for a cuddle because they are used to humans. Um, and then some days you get there and you can see the one that cuddled with you yesterday, he became part of the, of the flock. So that's kind of the things that you remember. I mean, there's not a, not a lot of people in the world that can say they spend a winter with flamingos at Campus Dam um, and monitoring them and watching them. Um, we had to make turns to go because at some stage you had to go three times a day. So it was a very intensive project. 
Um, and you got to know flamingos real, real intensively um, and by name. We even gave them names. And the whole family was, was involved. I mean, my kid was involved. Other people's families' wives was involved. So everybody formed kind of a bond around the flamingos. And we are still very, very bonded with the flamingos. Um, I, you just give a, give a phone call and say, how, how are you guys doing? Um, how's the flamingos doing? Have you been there? So you made a lot of good friends around the flamingos and you learned a lot about flamingos and made special bonds with them. Oh, that sounds really, really special. I, you know, can, can tourists go and see them as well? Or, you know, certainly I wouldn't expect that sort of uh, access, getting that close as a tourist. But, uh, you know, if you are visiting the area, how do you see them besides being on a luxury train like I did it before? Russell, that's one of our future projects that we'd love to do at this stage. Yes, tourists can go to, to watch flamingos, um, but it's not a very nice experience um, without the adjustments that we want to make. Obviously, they can't go to the southwestern side where the flamingos are breeding um, because that's privately owned land. But we would like to build a bird hide, a nice fancy bird hide in future where everybody can enjoy watching flamingos um, and interacting, not interacting with them, but interacting through binoculars with them. So that's, that's future plans that we do have lined up and that we are currently discussing is how, to, how we can achieve that, that objective. So, but at this stage, yes, people can go in, they can have a look at it, they can watch them from the N8 as well. Um, that drives right past, but that's not, a, that's not the kind of experience that birders would like. So in, in one, we are very grateful for, for the cameras that's, that's going to be there live so that everybody can have that experience. But if you want to do it in the wild, um, there's walks and, and routes that you can take to go and have a look. But let's hope in future we can build a bird, bird hide so that everybody can enjoy it from the luxury of a bird hide. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I know there's a few other, you know, parks and reserves around the country that do have those lovely hides set up next to, you know, large water bodies and it works really well. I think people really enjoy it, especially your bird photographers, you know, people sitting in the yeah. hide for hours trying to get good shots. So it's, yeah, I'm sure that would be great if you can get it up and running. Um, yes. You know, Esther, I was just thinking about your story about sitting with those, those flamingos. Um, I'm sure from all of that, a lot of the community around um, around Kimberley are you know absolutely in love with the with the the flamingos. You know, have are there a number of projects you know that they've been trying to help out with you? Uh, where you've seen community getting involved with with actually some of the the issues that we discussed about water quality and and as you said the you know actually saving the checks themselves. Yes, Russell, you know what, now I haven't seen people pull together like in 2019 um, when they actually, large numbers of the community actually came to help feed the, the flamingos for the time that they were in Kimberley, as well as some of the community, community members that helped to, to pick them up. It really pulled the community together. Um, for, the, for the first three weeks, um, that, was, that was very well organized. Um, I mean, businesses participated, people brought their children to assist anybody from the age 80 down to the age of 10 came to help to with, with the flamingos. So the community really helps with that. And then I must say environmental affairs is also very um, vigilant in helping with this, as well as uh, Donovan Smith, who is a local veterinarian in, in Kimberley. His door is always open for flamingos. Um, and we kind of have a partnership between the two of us. Um, I pick them up and and he nurses them back to health. So he's been a great help and he's also been involved in the projects from the beginning. He was the vet that stood there night after night trying to save flamingo babies alongside with us. <clears throat> so that I can say the community really pulls together um, during, during times like this and they are very proud of the flamingos. And if there's one thing that did happen in 2019 is that there's more focus on the lesser flamingos in Kimberley um, worldwide people participated in the project and some of the American people even was flying over to come and assist with what they knew about raising flamingos in captivity. So I think, yes, the community is very involved. At this stage, there's still people monitoring, um, monitoring the project. Um, and then as well as we are very involved in, in monitoring it from the mines perspective, we are looking at the water quality and um, we are working very closely with environmental affairs. So, we exchange a lot of, of information um, and 
they you can always call them and ask for assistance or they will always call us and ask for assistance so there's a very good relationship between us and the and the, um, the government as well as Kimberley veterinarian clinic um to to look after the flamingos amazing well long may it continue i hope that they keep staying involved but i can't imagine that would change as you say it's such a special site um, for you personally, you know, what's your hope for the future at Campus Dam? Well, I think the one thing that I do hope for is, is that we do get uh, to sort out the main issue that we do have with, with Campus Dam, and that's the water issue. If we can get the balance right and we can get all stakeholders to work together um, to realize that, that the flamingos are very important to Kimberley, Northern Cape and South Africa, that would be great. So I would my, my hope for the flamingos is, is that we do get to sort out all the issues around Campus Dam um, and the politics around Campus Dam so that we can more concentrate on saving the flamingos um, than saving people's egos. Um, and we can see them flourish and breed every year with great success without human interference. That would be my dream for Campus Dam and that we can establish tourism in the area so that everybody can have the opportunity to see a flamingo at least once in their lives. Yeah, that sounds amazing. And I, I know there'll be a lot of hard work ahead and it's going to be a, a, a tough road. But, um, you know, thank you to you and all the people involved. Uh, I hope that, uh, that things keep going in the right direction and the numbers keep growing. So thanks so much for your wonderful insights today, Esther. Um, it's been a great pleasure having you on the show with us. Um, and I look forward to being able to keep an eye out on these beautiful birds on the live cameras in the near future. So do we. Thank you very much, Russell, for, for having me. And thank you very much for doing the interview. I hope it, it reaches a lot of people and it um, raises awareness. Thank you, Esther. And thanks again to all of you uh, for watching. Please join us next week for another edition of AfriCam for Good, uh, brought to you by explore.org. But from all of us now, it's goodbye. Cheers for now.